Number one, Village of Elmont Zoning Bylaw, number 847-2021. And number two, Temporary Use Permit 2101, Trans Mountain Contractor Yard, located at 1755 Highway 5 South. At a public hearing, any person present who believes that they are affected by a matter being considered shall be given an opportunity to be heard on the matter contained in the proposal. Members of the public speaking to the proposal should, at the appropriate time, commence your address to this council by stating your name and area of residence, at which time you may give us the full benefit of your views concerning the proposal. Everyone who deems their interests are affected shall be given the opportunity to be heard at this meeting. No one will be or should feel discouraged or prevented from making their views known. All who submit their comments at this public hearing will restrict their remarks to matters contained in the proposals. And it is my responsibility as chairperson of this meeting to ensure that all remarks are so restricted. And at the conclusion of a public hearing, council may, without further notice, give whatever effect council believes proper to the representation made at the hearing. Item 4.1, we do have a presentation from staff this evening under for zoning bylaw number 847-2021. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, the Village of Belmont has undergone a major update and rewrite of our zoning bylaw. MVH Urban Planning and Design Inc. was hired to undertake this project and they will be presenting here shortly. If you don't mind, I'm just going to ask, can MVH hear me right now? Yes. Okay. Updating of the zoning bylaw will ensure consistency between it and the newly adopted official community plan and together assist in addressing some significant challenges facing the village of the, uh, the village of Elmount, including increasing unaffordability of housing, homeowner and development limitations due to inflexible and out-of-date regulations, limited pedestrian and transportation connectivity, the lack of an industrial and employment lands for job creation and economic diversification. Flat population growth, minimal development and commercial investments, far-reaching infrastructure with a limited taxation base, which increases property taxes per capita over time. The zoning bylaw will help tackle many of these issues by increasing the flexibility and permissions within the different zones. This is demonstrated through introduction of mixed zone, mixed use zones to promote infill and vibrancy in our commercial centers, decreased minimum lot and billing sizes to make development more affordable and allow for smaller dwellings. Increased in flexibility for accessory dwelling units to act as mortgage helpers and provide a different form of housing for the community. Increased flexibility in home based businesses regulations. It was identified that the village has a significant amount of vacant land that could be generated uh, that could generate more revenue if developed. The zoning bylaw supports residential and commercial infill. Infill utilizes existing assets and resources while reducing hurdles to more affordable housing and housing types. It promotes more development opportunities and flexibility and encourages a more vibrant downtown core. It was important that the uh, document be easy for property owners to understand and follow, so readability has been improved to create more user-friendly document. Combining similar zones and reducing the number of zones created more flexibility and simplifies the bylaw overall. The zoning approval process is the final step in our official community plan and zoning bylaw update. Once complete, the village will have two cohesive documents to guide future development in the community. Yes, sorry, I've concluded. Uh, Mr. Robinson, under 4.2, have there been written submissions received or a summary of submissions uh, prior to the proceedings? Yes, Mr. Mayor, as of noon today, we've had one written submission re received. This written submission is from Helen Park of Valmont, BC, regarding the proposed uh, zoning bylaw change. My name is Helen Park. I've been a resident of the village of Valmont, the village, for 17 years. I am also the owner of 1755 Highway 5 South, the property, as well as its neighboring property at 1655 Highway 5 South. I would like to raise concerns regarding the, the proposed zoning bylaw number 847-2021, which plans to, say the, to change the zoning designation of the property. While I'm generally in support of the new official community plan as a future outlook and plan to ad, add additional lands, industrial lands within the village's borders, the proposed immediate use of the zoning designation of the property 
currently identified as urban reserve to light industrial is in my opinion premature, premature and short-sighted and unreasonable. According to the proposed zoning bylaw draft, the, proposed, the purpose of uh, lands designated as light industrial is to facilitate economic development and there are 13 permitted uses for light industrial including business and professional office, education facility, manufacturing, light, and so forth. There, are no water, uh, so there is no water, sewage, or other necessary services currently connected to the property, and I am not aware of any plans by the village in the near future to do so. Enacting such zoning designation change to the property without having plans to install and connect such necessary services to the property to ensure the permitted uses under the new zoning are remotely feasible is severely premature. It seems though the village is not intent on actually supporting the industrial development of the village and only cares about increasing taxes. Short-sightedness of the village's proposal is apparent from the proposed temporary use permit of the property to Trans Mountain Pipeline LP, also known as Trans Mountain, which is also being currently discussed. The temporary use permit is only for three years and provides that Trans Mountain will use the property. Uh, the temporary use permit uh, does not pertain to this particular point of the public hearing, which is zoning. Thank you. I'm just... It is my hope that through this hearing process, the village reevaluates its position and have the property remain as urban reserve. I believe the village needs to take greater responsibility in supporting its residents and fulfilling its obligations to them instead of focusing solely on increasing taxes. Furthermore, zoning designation change should only be entertained after the village carefully considers and takes actions to actually support the industrial development of the village. Sincerely, Helen Park. Here there was one written submission only? Only one. Thank you. Under 4.3, we have a presentation by MVH Urban Planning and Design. Mr. Schmidt, welcome back. Hey, nice to be here. I wish I could be there in person. Would have been a nice trip. Uh, so thank you for the invitation. And uh, we also have Fraser Blythe here, and he will begin the presentation. Uh, I'll just share my screen here. Hopefully it'll all go Hi. Hi, everyone. Hi everyone, nice to see you again. Can we take it away, Fraser? Okay, um, hopefully everyone can hear me. Um, well, it, it's nice to be back presenting the draft zoning bylaw at public hearing. Um, first of all, I think we should start off um, on behalf of the team, just in thanking uh, Megan Vicente, uh, Chris Eddy, uh, Wayne and Silvio, who have been the village staff, uh, and they've really provided great support to us throughout the official community plan and the zoning bylaw process. Um, we think you've got a, uh, I, I know Megan's not there anymore, but uh, I think Krista's um, Krista and Wayne and Silvio are going to be great uh, um, support staff in implementing this zoning bylaw. So um, we'll start off uh, just by recognizing that the village of Bellmount respectfully acknowledges the unceded territory of the Sim First Nation. And tonight, uh, I know we've focused on specifics in the past, and I think tonight um, it's really important just to highlight some of the, the, the bigger moves we made in the draft zoning bylaw. I think Wayne's covered some of those, but um, just to, to kind of summarize the, the, the big things uh, on our end, um, we've tried to consolidate and reduce the total number of zones just to simplify things um, and also to help align with the official community plan, which kind of runs into the next point. Um, you know, there, there were some spot zones. So a spot zone is uh, an individual parcel that is zoned uh, something that's different from its neighbors. So in a lot of the work we did both with the zoning map and the zones themselves, um, 
we wanted to make a, mo a more coherent pattern, again, to align with the official community plan and just uh, provide some flexibility in those zones. We've also added some more mixed use zones, uh, both commercial and uh, residential focused. Um, we've increased the number of permitted uses in many of the commercial and mixed use zones. So Wayne mentioned that flexibility that people were looking for in the zoning bylaw. So um, hopefully you've seen that reflected in those commercial and mixed use zones. Um, we've also added some new zones. So we, we recognized that um, there was a need for light industrial within the community, uh, as well as this neighborhood mixed use zone. And, and that neighborhood mixed use zone is really about um, creating those neighborhood nodes, uh, promoting walkability. And again, it ties in a lot with the policies found in, in the OCP. And uh, we've also consolidated some of the multi-unit residential zones. So we, we kind of recognize that, um, <clears throat> you know, things like row houses and, uh, and apartments can be kind of fit in one zone and still create a cohesive, um, cohesive community. So this um, table is really a summary of how things have changed in the new zoning bylaw. Uh, on the left, you'll see the existing uh, zone designations, and on the right, you'll see the new ones. So you can see where we've combined multiple zones into one. Um, <clears throat> we've gone from 20 um, zones currently in the existing zoning bylaw to 15, and that includes adding uh, three new zones, those being the R1 residential large lot. So that's the area um, around Fowler Place. Um, <clears throat> we've also added the neighborhood mixed use C5, which um, we'll go over on the map, as well as that light industrial, <clears throat> excuse me. Um, some of the other bigger changes, Jonathan will go through these in more detail, but uh, the R1, R2, and R3 zones, we've combined into a single zone. <clears throat> Again, it, it provides some diversity without being restrictive, and it's still um, consistent with the intent of those three zones. As mentioned, the R4 and R5 zones have been con combined into a single zone. So again, providing that flexibility, if you have these parcels and <clears throat> you know, rather than being stuck only doing an apartment or only doing row houses, you now have, have the choice. Um, as well, there are three um, commercial zones that we've combined into the village center fringe mixed use. And, and part of the reason for this, again, is we just found there were a lot of these spot zones, um, really very specific zones assigned to um, individual parcels. And, uh, you know, we felt A, it would support the OCP as well as just the, the community and the um, make development a little bit easier and more straightforward by combining those into a single zone. Um, yeah, I think, I think, uh, oh, it's, I guess the other big question is the, uh, the CD1 zone. So we had discussed that and uh, we'll be leaving the CD1 zone as is. to the next slide. So this, uh, again, is really just a visual summary of some of the big changes we made. <clears throat> so this, the C1 zone, um, the village center mixed use, it, it stays the same. That's your kind of four blocks on Fifth Ave there. Um, again, in, in order to try and align better with the OCP um, and create that that corridor connection from the highway to the downtown, we've developed um, or we've consolidated a bunch, of, a bunch of zones into the village center fringe mixed use. So that runs um, from the highway towards the C1 zone, and then it also borders the C1 zone on the eastern edge. So you're going to get this transition of commercial uses in and out of the, 
the downtown core. Um, uh, we, you know, we, we talked about uh, Main Street as well, and Main Street seemed to have a, a mix of a lot of different zones. So there was a mix of residential and just very specific commercial uses in there. So, you know, as we go down, uh, C1 and C2 are primarily commercial focused. C3 is more of a commercial residential split zone. So um, people who live there who want to continue their residential use can continue to do so. Those who want to take advantage of uh, commercial zoning, maybe starting a business, they're able to do that as well. And that's the intent of the, the C3 zone. As mentioned, we identified the need for a neighborhood mixed use zone. So we developed this C5 neighborhood mixed use zone. And that's primarily a residentially focused zone, um, but it does allow small neighborhood oriented commercial uses. So uh, corner stores, um, cafes, restaurants, but uh, the commercial service or services are quite limited. And then within that, um, you know, the, the residential spectrum is quite broad. So single family duplex, um, up, up to multifamily, all within that zone. Um, yeah, I, yeah we, we also consolidated the multi-unit residential zones. So again, I, I think we've covered this, but uh, just instead of being limited to either or for fourplexes or row houses or apartments, uh, you now have the option to choose which one of those you want to do. And uh, finally, as mentioned, we've added a small uh, light industrial zone. Again, uh, the, the intent there really is to provide some commercial services that don't necessarily need, um, you know, full city services. I think that was a discussion we had about servicing on that side of the highway. Um, so the uses within that are really tailored towards uh, larger things uh, such as, you know, recycling depots, um, manufacturing service stations, that kind of thing. So it's, it's similar to um, the C4, C4 zone that we've got just to the north, but um, it, it also allows for a bit more of an industrial focus there. Next slide. And, and this is just a, a bit of a zoom in on the main commercial zones, just so you can you can see how we've tried to establish that mixed use corridor from the highway to uh, the village center and then transition out towards the east. And again, um, along Main Street, really pick up that diversity of commercial and residential uses. So I believe um, Jonathan is going to take over and talk about some of the finer details within the uh, zoning bylaw now. Thank you, Fraser, and thank you, Council, for this opportunity. Uh, I know Council is probably familiar with the document, but just for the public's sake as well, anyone watching or listening in, as mentioned uh, by Mr. Robertson, uh, Robinson, um, the document has, we believe, been improved in terms of readability. So we now have color coded sections. So if you're printing it in color, you'll uh, enjoy some differentiation. However, most people are browsing these larger zoning bylaws in PDF form, in digital form. So we have uh, not only colors to appease the eye and to differentiate the different zones so you know which one you're in, but also using um, hyperlink technology. So when you're browsing the document and you see a land use such as single, single detached dwelling, you can click on that and it will jump you to the definition uh, if you would like to know what that means and how it's defined. Um, usually not such a concern for things like single detached dwelling, but for other land uses, oftentimes the definitions are very important as 
as well as the regulations that are applicable. So we've tried to make it really user friendly in that way. And uh, the colors do also link to that important zoning map in the colors that you'll find there. Um, we have also added uh, a few graphics and illustrations. Your existing zoning bylaw actually did a pretty good job of that as well, but we've we've added more and hopefully that for the visual readers amongst us, visual learners, that helps to aid in understanding. Um, because one of the things that I always hope is that the public find these documents as accessible as possible. They are daunting for your average citizen. Um, however, if we can move the needle and make them more accessible, I think that's that's a benefit to everyone and it's a more democratic approach to government and regulation if people can understand what they're reading. So I'll just provide a few examples just to get into a few of the more pertinent zones and just how it looks within the bylaw. So these are some screenshots of the R2 zone. So the majority of residential lots in the village are now R2 and that allows for single detached dwellings and two unit dwellings. The addition of the two unit dwellings within the majority of the village's lots uh, was done prior to this bylaw. It's within the existing one and I believe it was an amendment a year or two ago um, or three maybe now whereby uh, it was looked upon as being uh, an improvement to the village to allow for those two unit dwellings within the majority of lots. So what else you will see within the R2, disc, the R2 zone, as well as other zones is a list of accessory uses. So as mentioned, accessory dwelling units, so that's your laneway homes or secondary suites. Um, those are accessory uses and there are specific provisions within the bylaw and regulations around that, that land use. And so those who wish to know further can, can consult that and we've tried to provide these uh, helpful little um, hints as to where to find more information when you're looking here. Uh, conditional uses, um, there was talk during the formation of this, of this bylaw around um, mobile dwellings and so that's been added as a conditional use with, uh, with an age, which an age criteria and then short-term vacation rentals, minor. So there's minor and major um, and uh, those are allowed as a conditional use within the R2 as well. Um, also, as mentioned, a lot of the regulations we spent a long time with staff um, and discussing um, with some of the public as well on things like building width, um, as well as minimum parcel area, which is reduced um, a bit, as well as lot lot dimension, site coverage, and then building height. So it gets into the minutia, but we've tried to provide more, more flexibility and uh, as well as maintain the character of the village and the character of, of what is existing while allowing some room for evolution of the village over time um, to facilitate uh, what may be coming and desired by your citizens for future development. I'll now switch uh, to the C3 zone as an example of one of the mixed use zones. You'll see here the difference between the residential zones, which have very few permitted uses, um, which are focused on residential uses to these mixed use zones, which uh, have a long list of, of, of permitted uses. Because as Fraser said, we in some ways combined a number of different zones to create this this zone to allow for that uniformity within the main street area so that everyone would be within one zone. However, uh, that requires that there be allowed more permitted uses. So we have a mixture of dwelling unit types allowed as well as retail opportunities, commercial and otherwise non-residential uses that are allowed. You have some accessory uses as well. So accessory dwelling units also allowed um, short-term vacation rentals, minor as well, and then some additional conditions for accessory dwelling units um, provided here too within the C3 zone. You have your standard 
regulations around measurable standards here, uh, parcel areas. Um, so we're moving to one minimum parcel area here um, versus the present, which with different zones, you have different minimum parcel areas. So adding some uniformity there as well. And then setbacks, maximum height and onward as well as lot, lot coverage. So we've really tried to provide a uh, user friendly bylaw that's easy to read and uh, hopefully people can find the information they need when trying to draw up their blueprints and make decisions uh, about future development within the village. So just end here back on the map. If there's any questions, we could go into a lot of detail on the bylaw. However, we don't want to take up everyone's time. So if there are questions, we'd be happy to answer them. And uh, I do have a copy open as well of it in case there's specific comments or concerns or questions about details in the regulations. So thanks again for the opportunity to work with the village on this and we're here for questions. Thank you very much, Mr. Schmidt. The under 4.4, .4, are there any verbal presentations from the public? Second time. Under 4.4, .4, are there any verbal presentations from the public? And a third and final call for verbal presentations from the public. You're off the hook, Mr. Schmidt. However, are there under 4.6, are there any questions from council for either staff or the consultants? Hearing none. Thank you very much, Mr. Schmidt. Mr. Blythe, always a privilege to have you here. Looking forward to our next adventure together. For sure. Likewise, you let us off easy, for sure. Thanks again. <clears throat> Item five, we do have a temporary use permit Trans Mountain Pipeline to consider. Uh, and as such, I will declare a pecuniary conflict of interest as I do have some equipment on the pipeline itself. So, Mr. Person. You'll go from there? Yeah. Okay, item five, temporary use permit, Trans Mountain Pipeline. Uh, Mayor Torgerson has read the public hearing statement that governs this meeting. Item 5.1, presentation by staff. Mr. Robinson. Thank you, Chair Pierce. Temporary use permit 21-01 proposes to allow the Trans Mountain Expansion Project to operate for up to three years at 1755 Highway 5 South legally described as Block F of the Southeast Quarter of District Lot 7354 Caribou District. A temporary use permit was previously given approval in February of 2020 for a period of three years. There have been changes to the uses, maximum personnel and hours of operation since this time. Therefore, a new temporary use permit was required. The predominant use of the site is office space for the coordination and management of pipeline construction activities in the Robson Valley and Thompson, uh, sorry, in North Thompson. Uh, in addition to day-to-day -to -day administrative and management functions, the site will also be used for pipe bending, storage, a meeting and marshalling area, equipment and vehicle repairs and servicing, and temporary storage for equipment and materials. Changes to the original permit include Increases of personnel on site from 50 to a maximum of 300 at any given time. Extension of pipe bending hours from 9 a.m. to 4 p.m. to 6 a.m. to 6 p.m. And changes to the configuration increase uh, to the number of buildings on site. At the regular meeting of June 8, 2021, Council gave initial approval for the proposed temporary use permit. Since then, adjacent property owners have been notified of the proposal and affected residents have been invited to provide feedback via written submissions to the village or at this evening's public hearing. That's all. Thank you. 
Uh, item 5.2, uh, have we received any written submissions uh, prior to the proceedings? Yes, there were three written submissions received from the public as of noon today. The first submission comes from Reg and Stacy McNee of Vailmount. As per correspondence received, we deem our property to be affected by the proposed temporary use permit 2101. When construction commenced on the site last year, which is located directly across from the highway from our home, our house started shaking and pictures were bouncing off the walls. We contacted the village to find out what we could do about it and we were given Trans Mountain's complaint line. We contacted them and advised uh, what we were experiencing. They explained, it as, they explained it as just sound waves and that it would not do any damage to our home. Eventually, they stopped answering our emails. After enduring our house shaking for approximately five to six months, the toilet hose on our upstairs bathroom broke loose, causing 20,000 in damage from the consequential flooding of our main floor and basement. We have continuously been woken up at all hours of the night and even on Sundays to uh, the sound of backup alarms and their air horns. Uh, we have begun uh, documenting these incidents and they, recur they occur daily. The access road for the property is located directly across the highway from our property, so we hear all of the vehicles that enter and exit the site. Large bright lights shine into our home at night from the job site. Sitting out in the yard is no longer enjoyable due to the noise. We are unaware that due to the forest fire risks, uh, crews have been starting work as early as 3 a.m. and they, are, they all report to this yard before they set out for the day. We complained to Wayne Robinson, CAO and acting by law enforcement officer. We received a written response June 16, 2021, advising us that no work on this site starts until 7 a.m. This is untrue. I am closing a copy of his letter. We have maintained contact with Mr. Robinson and he has been in contact with Trans Mountain. They claim that the noise is coming from the Best Western Hotel. This is completely false. We are not against the pipeline in any way. However, we are against being disruptive for possibly the next five years. Sincerely, Reg and Stacy McNee. I did not include uh, the email that uh, I sent to, or the letter I sent to uh, Reg McNee, only because uh, it's, it's not exactly relevant to, to the letter that uh, they put forward. Uh, second letter comes from Riley Nordley and uh, Cherise Smith, Mayor and Council. This letter is in respect to Leadcore Industrial Site on Highway 5. We, the owners of a place in Cranberry Place, moved into a beautiful neighborhood full of gorgeous vacation rental homes a year ago, not expecting to experience a seven day a week, 24 hour day industrial site. The noise from machines starts at 5 a.m. and does not stop until after 11 p.m. Loud beeping from backup signals is nonstop all day long and are frequently woken up at night. After dark, there are large spotlights shining directly into our bedroom patio doors, which makes sleeping difficult. We have a beautiful home and gorgeous view, but cannot sit on our patio and enjoy them. The sound of engine brakes and machinery beeping alongside loud crashes uh, crashes, sorry, every is, is destroying the property we were so proud to purchase. This is not a peaceful, quiet neighborhood worth paying $500,000 or more to live in, plus significant taxes. Cranberry Place and Cranberry Marsh is now an industrial zone. It is full of noise pollution and sand tornadoes wafting over and destroying our backyards and patios. Something needs to be rectified here. Our beautiful investment properties are now being affected dr drastically in a negative way. None of the residents of Cranberry Place signed up for this while purchasing our homes. It is uncomfortable for many of us to complain as most of us are supportive of the pipeline industry and are even pipeline families. However, it doesn't change the fact that it is unfair to expect us to live like this for an undetermined length of time. Apparently, this is supposed to go on for years. Our investments into our home and community is very important to us, at least just as important as the twinning of the pipeline. Perhaps more so given our community's sole economic industry is tourism. It seems inappropriate for this to be happening considering we have invested in a tourism community and purchased a home in a vacation rental neighborhood located in a peaceful valley in the, in the mountains. We have a right to uh, protect our investment in our home and our community. As such, we are looking for solutions. Our intentions are not to shut down operations. We are supportive of them, but solutions must be found. For example, sound barrier fencing, move engine brake signs further up the highway, flanges to block light pollution on highway side and dust dampening measures. 
Also, our property taxes reflect that of a tourist destination with mountain views in a premium area. Perhaps this needs to be revisited as we are now in an industrial zone. Our property values have most certainly decreased. Thank you for your consideration. We look forward to a timely resolution. Regards, Riley Nordley and Cherise Smith. And for our last uh, submission uh, from Dan and Sylvia uh, Cuddyback, also of uh, Valemount, BC. Uh, the spotlights from Trans Mountain Pipeline Yard are shining very bright in the bedroom windows on the second floor of our house at night. It can be tolerated during the, seven the summer months when we have leaves on the deciduous trees to provide some cover. We ask the representatives of Trans Mountain Pipeline to please find a solution for the upcoming fall and winter months to put a screen in front of lights or to turn away those lights from the houses on Cranberry Place. Thank you for your efforts. Time re kind regards, Dan and Sylvia Kudibak. And that is all of the public submissions that were submitted by writing. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, item 5.3, are there any verbal presentations from the public? Second call, any verbal presentations from the public? And third and final call for any presentation, verbal presentations from the public. Hearing none, we'll move on to item 5.4, a presentation by Trans Mountain Pipeline. Welcome, Ms. Devitt. Hi. I wanted to say how very excited I am to be here um, because for the last year, um, Trans Mountain has maintained uh, our position that we would only have essential workers um, in your community. Mm -hmm. And I was able to do my job remotely, so I, I haven't been in Valmount. So I'm very happy to be back. All right, so uh, we are here to talk about the temporary use permit application uh, for our contractor yard. And we'll just scroll down a little bit. Um, as you see on the screen here, this is the proposed plot and, uh, and where the contractor yard currently sits. I'll get Silvio to readjust that for me. <laughs> Perfect. All right. Um, so this is the uh, the map and the layout uh, of the schematics of the plot that we are currently using. Um, as you can see, uh, we have changed our access uh, from previous, and we now uh, have our, our main access off of the highway um, just in alignment with the best western driveway as per Modi's requirements. And the northern end uh, into the Dysol parking lot uh, uh, is only for emergency access only. Um, the yard has changed. Uh, I was here in January of 2020, which feels like a lifetime ago. Um, and I made this presentation. And at that point in time, um, we thought that we may have significantly less workers mustering here. However, um, the yard has become quite key. And with the amount of pipe storage that we have in the Valemount Community Forest, uh, we have more of our offices here in the contractor yard. So on the site, uh, we have a variety of buildings, more buildings than we had earlier indicated, but we have our warehouse, our shop, wash cars, of course, our guard shacks at all of our entrances and our emergency exits, waste bins, fueling, fueling stations, parking. We have material storage and pipe bending areas. We have our helipad for emergency uh, evacuation if needed for um, a first aid event. Uh, stormwater management pond, which is uh, at basically smack dab north uh, in the lot, and then also a topsoil storage area. Uh, I know that the, the pipe bending is seems to be of, of a lot of interest. Um, there has been pipe bending going on in that yard, um, but we did uh, originally stick to the um, uh, asked restricted hours. Uh, we've done some noise monitoring on site, and the pipe bending itself isn't actually making noise. So that's why you will see a request for us to extend those hours uh, in this application. So I think everybody has seen, uh, at least from a distance, what the yard looks like and what type of activity happens there. Um, but of course, there's always questions about light 
and noise. And uh, we had some of those submissions from the public today. So as far as light mitigation goes, um, when we are given a complaint um, through our complaints line, which is um, put out in print broadcasting, our print advertisements, uh, web advertisements, on our websites, on our notifications, um, basically on everything that we do, uh, we have our complaints line. And uh, if any individual of the public uh, were to have a light shining in their bedroom, uh, we had something like that actually happen down um, in the Clearwater area the other day. We were HDDing under Raft River, and uh, we set up some lighting, and we didn't quite realize that it was going to shine through a patch of deciduous trees. We got a phone call. It was fixed that evening. So as far as any sort of light mitigation goes, um, we use directional lighting, we use diffusion, and when they're not being used, we turn them off. There are some for security, but none of them would uh, need to be shining in the direction of a home. So uh, any of those light mitigation questions can easily be dealt with. Noise mitigation is a little bit of a different story. Um, so we have best practices that we use um, we enclose noisy equipment and using baffles and shrouds. We use noise suppression on some of our heavy equipment, like our track vehicles that we use to move pipe or move materials. Um, we have a strategically located sound wall. And as a matter of fact, when that site was originally uh, created, that sound wall only went about halfway down the uh, length of the um, plot. Um, but as we were building, we noticed that there were homes there. We were originally attempting to baffle noises from the Best Western. But of course, um, with a couple of complaints that came in, we extended that uh, material sound wall um, the entire length of the property. Our construction hours will meet the requirements um, outlined in our permits. And the typical working hours are weekdays from 7 a.m. to 7 p.m. and from Saturday from 7 a.m. to 7 p.m. as well. Uh, work will only take uh, place on Sundays during critical activities, and there has been critical activities lately. Um, with the wildfire rating and the need for shutdowns to occur at 1 p.m. and for fire watches to start taking place at 2 p.m., our construction activities have been pushed back. We have been starting earlier. Um, because of that, and because we know that it is starting at an early rate, uh, we are asking crews to um, muster uh, at locations outside of the village, understanding that a 3 a.m. tailgate, although a great safety practice, probably I wouldn't want right beside my house either. Um, so that's things that have been happening um, when... Um, at the time of some of the complaints that came in, in particular ones that I spoke to um, some of the staff about, we had not started working at 3 a.m. at that point in time. We were still sticking to our original construction hours of 7 to 7. Um, actually, I, I should go back and, and talk about noise mitigation a little bit more. Uh, I went over to the yard today and uh, I talked to our construction crews about noise and this concern. And uh, actually, a couple of weeks ago, I asked our crews to go out with um, audio monitors and to be in the yard at the noisiest times. At the very beginning of the day, at the very end of the day, they went over with noise monitors over into the Best Western parking lot, which was as close as respectful to some of the noise complaints that we had. And they could not pick up any of the backup alarms. We had trucks back up the entire length of our property and we didn't pick them up. Um, the things that were registering the highest were fully loaded semi-trailers coming down the highway and we had four motorcycles pass by which actually uh, topped out our decibel ratings at 88 decibels. Um, we endeavor to uh, identify and work with any of our local stakeholders um, if they have complaints. And I've asked our team to once again get more creative. And so we currently have a soil berm there and I'm asking them what more can be done. Can we, is it safe to make it higher? Would that make a difference? We're no longer in the north end of the lot where Dysol is, is, is that going to make a difference? Um, and we've even talked about bringing in sea cans as an additional layer 
And the really nice thing about that would be um, a potential community benefit once the project is done. As far as dust suppression goes, um, we are maintaining access roads during construction to ensure that dust control measures are in place where warranted. Um, we, all, we are obliged and, and regulated to clean our equipment uh, prior to leaving construction sites. Um, any fo foreign debris has to be um, cleaned as quickly as practical for equipment crossings. And um, we need to make sure that we're not transferring uh, vegetative materials from one location to another. As far as our traffic management goes, uh, part of our plan was to move that access south uh, across from the Best Western parking lot to align better with that location. And that was done in conjunction with Modi. Um, and so that was partially their wishes. We're playing in their sandbox when it comes to the highway. Um, we also develop notification plans, including traffic control and uh, those changeable um, digital signs that you see upon the highway. Uh, we didn't want Bailmount to look like Vegas, so we talk to Modi frequently about how closely those signs need to be placed um, to not create a visual distraction in themselves. When we're trying to make something safer, we don't want to inadvertently um, add too much distraction at the side of the road. And now I get into our inquiries and complaints process. And I think that this is an important part of this TUP application um, because there is the potential that our yard could cause some uncomfortable or plain not great uh, environments for the people around it. But we do have a regulated process in order to do that. Since 2012, uh, the department that I worked in has responded to queries, concerns, and complaints and questions. We're at over 10,000 at this point in time, but we've been at it for a while. Um, we refer to this progress as InfoAt. Um, it was further enhanced and developed even more to work us through the construction phase of the process. Um, we have an, an email and a toll-free line, um, info at transmountain.com and our 1866 number. I know the thought of calling a 1866 number and leaving a voicemail is never really that fantastic. Um, you know, people wonder if it kind of falls into a, a black hole, um, but we are regulated to answer those questions. If somebody makes an inquiry or a complaint to a worker that just happens to be walking by, they may do their best and they may have the best of intentions, but they could get distracted. They could be going on vacation and that complaint never actually makes it through to our team to address. This format is the surefire way to get answers. And some of the uh, stakeholders and neighbors in the area have used this process quite extensively and we've answered them quite extensively over the years when it comes to things like noise and vibration and uh, concerns about their properties. So uh, we rank them into urgent and non-urgent. A light in my bedroom window would definitely be urgent. It would be urgent to me and it's urgent to our team. A non-urgent general inquiry would be um, something along the lines of, you know, I noticed that um, there was some debris. This actually happened at that site. There was some garbage collecting on the side of the berm, the sound berm that we had. Our staff wasn't noticing it because they're not on that side of the highway, but it was just debris from the road. We deemed that non-urgent. It was addressed, it was responded to and taken care of within five business days. So that's the kind of classification we have between the two. As far as our ongoing communications go, we have our website, which is, has our interactive map, which is geotargeted. As soon as you pull it up, it'll see you're in Valemount. It'll bring you to Valemount. It shows future construction, uh, things that are 30 days in advance, active construction, maintenance work, points of construction interest, like the, camp, like the yard and the camp. And there's a summary of activity and what type of more detailed information you might want to have. I always break it down into what will I hear, what will I smell, what will I see. Those are the types of things we answer. And then people can sign up for email updates. They're automated, they come in monthly, it brings in information from our interactive map and you can subscribe to the community. Maybe you have a family member who's living in Merritt and you can keep up to date with what's happening there as well. 
Everybody can contact us at all of these. I'm pretty sure that my phone number is uh, widely distributed at this point in time, and I'm always available. Um, so that is our, our, our way that we kind of mitigate um, any issues that may come from our yard and the ongoing efforts that we are making in order to have us um, maybe be that, that test guinea pig for your light industrial uh, future zoning purposes. I do have two colleagues who are on the line from our permitting uh, team, Colin Carlson and Gary Davidson. And so um, I'm not entirely sure if they have anything to add to the presentation, uh, but I think they also could be good options if there were to be any questions. Good evening, gentlemen. Did you have anything to uh, add to Ms. Devick's presentation? Um, no, thanks, Jasmine, for covering everything off. The only two things um, I thought I might mention here is um, in the original application we submitted, I believe about a year and a half ago, um, we were asked to get electrical um, connections made to the grid. And we did do that um, to meet the, the motion made by council, um, stipulating that that was to be a condition of the site. And then there was also one um, limiting the, the pipe bending hours. I think that was council resolution 7420 um, that stipulated that bending activities take place only between nine and four. And uh, we have stuck to that as well. So. Um, I don't believe there are any changes being proposed to that. However, we did um, in our new application submit some clarifications around some select generator use. Um, basically, we can't power every single component on the site using hardline power. So if there were any questions on any of that, uh, we'd be happy to, to try and take those away or, or answer them here if possible. Okay, thank you for that. Anything else? All right. Thank you very much. Is this Colin Carlson? No, oh, sorry, okay. Colin. Thank you. I, I think the, my colleagues have covered everything. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Sorry I missed you there. All right. Uh, hearing nothing further, we'll move on to 5.5. Uh, and uh, we'll call for proponents or staff response to the questions and comments from public. Are we talking the written submissions? Okay. Okay, so we had no verbal presentations. So I guess we can ask for any questions from the public. Doesn't appear to be. Item 5.6, questions from council. Councillor Blanchett. Things. Um, you stated, you said there was no noise from pipe bending. Can you explain, please? Yes, um, I can elaborate on that a little bit. Uh, there's, there's no extraordinary noise from pipe bending. So the regular activities that we would be conducting within the yard, whether that be moving pieces of equipment, um, relocating soil berms, uh, the pipe bending decibel levels would all be within that same range. So there's no extraordinary, I guess I, that's... Uh, yeah, that's landing a, on the plot that's a, or yes, that's an important word. There's no extraordinary noise from the okay. pipe bending. Um, so it sounds like, I mean, you guys are, you know, doing everything humanly possible to connect with our um, citizens when they have an issue. Um, but we have had three just in this little clump, and a lot of people don't complain. So, mm -hmm. you know, kudos to the ones that step forward. Um, so there's been three complaints of light. Um, are those going to be addressed or have they been addressed? Um, the, the three that are here in front of us tonight. The three that are here in front of us tonight were just given to us tonight. Oh, okay, all right. So, so we, those will be addressed? They will be addressed. Okay. Um, we will likely, uh, upon receipt of those letters, um, be able to follow up with those individuals okay. from the public. We hadn't received those complaints ourselves. Oh, okay, all right. Well, perfect then. Okay. Um, and you have changed your muster points, which is um, good. So thank you yes. for that. Um, yeah, I mean, it sounds like you guys are doing everything that you can. So thank you for that, and thank you for addressing these three um, 
issues here. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah. Oh. Councillor McLean. Thank you. I, I had similar questions as to whether these um, had been addressed, particularly the one that um, states that the 20,000 worth of damage was done mm -hmm. to their house. That, that, that was my concern that hoping you are going to address those. Um, I, I also um, was interested in the study that you had done to indicate that most of the noise came from the highway, including these backup beeping noises and... Yeah, they weren't registering um, on any of our audible noise monitors uh, at the Best Western. Um, we, we used multiple vehicles, multiple types of vehicles to attempt to uh, recreate and, and we didn't even just recreate. We, we were out front um, at 7 a.m. attempting to get any decibel level reading from them from across the highway with highway noise and we were unable to do that. Thank you. Councillor G, anything from you? Um, I just, uh, a couple, not so much a question and comment. Uh, having worked in an industrial setting mo all my career, um, backup beepers are the bane of our existence. In an industrial setting, when you're dealing with the public, uh, we were never popular in motels as a uh, CN cruise. Um, is there any way at looking at traffic flows within the site to eliminate? Uh, you won't eliminate, but to reduce backing up. Yeah. Um, uh, thank you for that. Um, early on in our construction phase, um, Mr. McNee uh, brought forward some concerns about the backup alarms and at that point in time, and some of the vibrations. Um, so at that point in time, we switched any of our metal track machinery over to rubber track machinery. Uh, we then also changed the directional of the traffic in the yard so that uh, at the very end of the day, when people were awake, uh, we were backing into spots so that we could simply pull out in the morning. So there wasn't, um, a, you know, this mass exodus using backup alarms. And we do attempt to do that where we can. Uh, we have had conversations about triple beeping versus backup, um, but our, secu our safety team has firmly come down that uh, the backup alarms are, are necessary. So... Um, it's also the bane of our existence. <laughs> yeah, no, they are a necessary evil, and uh, there's not a lot you can do um, to avoid that situation. And that, so, um, and follow up on um, Councillor Blanchett's with the the light pollution. Uh, light pollution in general is a huge issue, um, and I haven't have driven by there at night, and it is a serious concern. So. We would be more than happy to take a look at that. Um, we have our environmental monitors, so they can look at it specifically from a light pollution perspective, mm -hmm. and we can see what additional measures could be placed um, on the site. Like I said, if we if we don't get complaints about the site, and I can appreciate that not people who are very supportive don't necessarily want to complain, but if we if we don't know that it's an issue, then we d we don't address it. So. Um, if that is a concern, I would be more than happy to take it back to our environmental team. And of course, these three additional concerns of the neighbors from across the highway yep. to look at our light pollution effects from that yard, especially in a beautiful place like this where you're used to it being pretty dark at night. Yeah. Yeah, we kind of like to see, see the stars at night. So, um, and, and if I could, I mean, a, a suggestion might be that you actually do door to door visits in that neighborhood and just because again a lot of people will not complain but yeah so absolutely okay anything else from council just thank you for, for coming and, and speaking and for addressing these because it's really important for absolutely. all of us we, we want to be the best neighbors we can and we know that there are a lot of workers <laughs> here right now and so we're uh we're the type. We're the type of neighbors when it's family, and, and <laughs> we just haven't quite left yet. And so <laughs> we're going to be here for a while. So we'd like to make it as harmonious as possible. There we go. All right. Well, thank you again for the presentation. Thank you. I'll be and back. And yes, I'll be back later. <laughs> we will see you shortly. Uh, so at this time, hearing nothing further, uh, item six, adjournment of the public meeting. Councillor Blanchett, Councillor G, and we'll show it.
adjourned at 8.01. Thank you.